Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the Jerusalem Fund and our educational program, the Palestine Center. My name is Zena Azam and I'm the executive director here. I'm so delighted to have all of you with us today to this very important event. And welcome also to our online audience. We are so honored and so pleased to have Dr. Mads Gilbert with us today and really so pleased that he included the Jerusalem Fund as a stop on his tour in the United States. Thank you for being with us and uh, about to tell us about your most important work in Gaza during the last invasion in the summer of 2014 and for so many trips and work in Gaza that you've done in the past. Dr. Mads Gilbert arrived in Gaza a few days after the Israeli invasion of Gaza in 2014. He began uh, and he worked day and night for the next two weeks at Al Shifa Hospital, dealing with casualties, repairing serious injuries, and trying to save lives. While helping the wounded, he kept a camera in the pocket of his scrubs, enabling him to document some of the human cost paid by the Palestinian people for enduring the Israeli invasion. His book, Night in Gaza, here. This is the result of his camera work. It's a photo story of the real situation in Gaza's hospitals that very few people actually ever see. The story in this book is also a tribute to the courage, endurance, and amazing spirit of Palestinian healthcare workers and volunteers, a spirit that we see throughout the society of Gaza, which has endured so many difficult challenges for many years. The book will be available after the talk, and uh, Dr. Gilbert is also ready to sign copies as well. Let me introduce him quickly. He's a me Dr. Mads Gilbert is a medical doctor at the University Hospital of North Norway. Since 1981, he's been going regularly to Palestine as a teacher and emergency care doctor in Palestinian hospitals on behalf of UNRWA, the UN agency to help Palestinian refugees. Over the last few years, he has worked in Gaza during successive waves of Israeli attacks on the densely populated area under siege. He's also co-author with Eric Fosse of Eyes in Gaza, which was hailed by the influential New Norwegian newspaper Classic Kampen as the best book of 2009. He will speak to us for about an hour, after which we'll take questions. For those of you who are online, we're not going to be streaming the photographs you'll see because these photographs are confidential. So you, you, can, you can just do with uh, listening to Dr. Gilbert. Please join me in giving a very warm and hearty welcome to Dr. Mads Gilbert. Thank you so much for the good words and good uh, morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Salam alaikum. Uh, I'm extremely happy to be here. It's my second time at Jerusalem Fund, and um, every time I feel very privileged to come here. This first picture, I think, is a telling story. Can we take down the lights in the front? Yes. I'll, I, I have controlled the sound now, brother, in the control room. This picture is what it is all about today. It's about Gaza, it's about children, it's about the future, and it's about the Israeli brutal attacks on Gaza. This is a little girl. She's in her neighborhood in Sashaya. It's August last year. It's just after the ceasefire. And she is indeed the representative of the Palestinian future. The young generation in Gaza, mostly below 18 years, 60% being 24 or less. And she's working in the totally uh, devastated neighborhood of her, her, her friends, her family. Her school is probably damaged, and she is proudly walking towards her future. Still under siege, she's still there as we are speaking. And um, she is part of our responsibility. There are two main events in Washington today. As you know, this is the most important. The second most important is that Netanyahu is going to the White House, <laughs> which is far less important because he will just get the same old guarantees that the U.S. government and the U.S. money and the U.S. arms industry is continuously supporting the occupation of uh, Palestine, and they will continue to support 
all the war crimes and all the colonial measures to expand Israel on behalf or on at the cost of the Palestinian people. Pictures are important. Children are important. Justice is important. Um, some moments of truth that we all remember, which led to major chance, uh, ch uh, changes. Um, those of you who are old enough will remember this picture from Sharperville. You remember that picture? It is the young boy, Hector Peterson, who was killed by the apartheid white police forces. It's 1960. It's the uprising in Sharperville. Uh, and over 500 people were killed in this uprising, which included Soweto. The picture went all over the world, and it hit the hearts of good people all over the world. And it was part of the start of the end of apartheid in South Africa. And the end of apartheid in South Africa rested on the struggle of the South African people and on the international support through boycott, divestment, and sanctions on a wide scale. The second picture from Vietnam. We all remember the little girl running with burning napalm on her back as a very graphic illustration of the brutality of the US occupation of Vietnam and the just struggle of the, of, of the Vietnamese people. It's June 8, 1972. During those days, we still had an unembedded uh, media. They reported honestly from what happened around the world. They were not in green uniforms and sitting at the table of the generals doing the invasions and the bombing. They were truly independent journalists. Today, mainstream media is mostly lying to you, lying about the realities, lying about the facts on the ground, lying about the human suffering of the militarism and the military so-called solutions. So what I will do today is to share with you some of my pictures to try to show you the sharp end of the Israeli occupation of Palestine, and what kind of human, moral, and political consequences the US support for this colonial project has for the people, ordinary people like you and me, on the ground in occupied Palestine. We know that these pictures started uh, a large movement in the US, Kent State University, the killing of the students, and the opposition against the US government's use of US military forces in Vietnam. And they were, uh, sooner or later, they were all taken back to the US. July last year, four Palestinian Shababs. I will ask you, please, you can take pictures of me and graphs, but do not take pictures of patients, OK? This you can take picture of because it's a public uh, picture. These are the four small Bakr boys who were all killed on the shores of Gaza City, just next to the Fisherman's Harbor, while playing soccer with their three other cousins that we treated in Shifa. They were shot dead by Israeli rockets for no good reason. It should be a picture similar to the Soweto picture. It should be a picture turning the guts, turning the tables, turning the power. Unfortunately, the mainstream media is not prodding deeply enough into it and giving us the true story. So I will talk to you today uh, with the title Night in Gaza. What have I seen? I'm a very proud supporter of the Palestinian cause. I've been working with the Palestinians since 1981. In 1982, I was in Beirut during the Israeli siege and bombardment of uh, Beirut. And it was a graphic experience for me as a young doctor to precisely see the sharp end of the Israeli military machine. When they pounded West Beirut for the whole summer of 1982, they did the same as they do in Gaza now. They cut the water supply, the power supply, the medical supply, the food supply, and they bombed everything. Hospitals, ambulances, residential areas, schools, pipelines, water pipelines, sewer, sewage, everything. I've been working in Gaza for the last 15 years, and when I travel now, I travel on behalf of my university hospital, which has a flying penguin as its symbol. It's very stupid, because uh, we don't have penguins in the north, it's in the south, and they can't fly. And that's why we have the symbol, because, of course, the, the one-liner is they told us, told us it was impossible, that we are flying high. So I'm very proud to be part of a, a sort of a, a strong solidarity movement in Norway among, among medical staff and medical institutions to support Palestine. When I go to Gaza, I go 
as a representative of my hospital. I'm on call, I get my full payment, they pay my ticket and my insurance, and I represent my hospital and my university in Gaza uh, as one of the many supporters of the Palestinian cause. And I will share with you some of my experiences. Some of the painful ones, some of the, 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 the less painful ones. The pictures are all taken by me. If it's not a photo caption on them, uh, I have the permission to show the pictures uh, from permission from the patient and or the family and or the hospital director and or the Minister of Health. Every picture in the book is, has a signed permission from the Minister of Health to be shown, but I don't have the permission to spread it uh, uncontrolled on the internet. That's why you cannot take pictures of my patient pictures. Would anybody allow a Palestinian doctor to come into my hospital in Norway and start taking pictures and showing them in Palestine? No. So just being sharp about these sort of separate decisions you have to make is to take a little battle with your own Orientalism. Because Orientalism and colonialism is still at the core of most of the Western uh, humanitarian support for the Global South. So we have to fight that attitude all the time. Where do I come from? Well, I come from uh, Tromsø, which is far up north here, two days north of the Arctic Circle. Uh, we used to say that we have uh, 11 months of winter and four weeks of less good skiing conditions. Uh, now we don't have any sunshine at all, but we have the fantastic Aurora Borealis. Tromsø is a very international city. It used to be called the, called the port to the Arctic. It's been a twin city, formerly with Gaza City, since 2001. And it's been a true blessing, this twin city construction. It's a, a, a political decision in the city council. Now we don't have sunshine, but Aurora Borealis in summer, we have uh, bright sunshine 24 hours. I took this at midnight last summer. I was out kayaking. We're stinking rich in Norway. We're obnoxiously spoiled. We're rolling around in wealth and uh, prosperity. And it is our damned duty to share our surplus with the less fortunate. So I think that is uh, an obligation for all of us. Thank you. So we have a very strong friendship organization uh, and we have regular um, travels between the two cities uh, whenever we can, whenever the occupiers are allowing us to travel. Currently I'm being banned from travel, traveling to Gaza, as you know, but I will go back, inshallah. This is me at uh, work on call. I'm sitting in the doorway. This is our ambulance helicopter, state ambulance helicopter. This is my paramedic in the helicopter, the pilot is flying. I am trying to uh, sort of direct the pilot. And we are training on how to rescue a uh, half fat, spoiled Norwegian skier <laughs> sitting here somewhere in the mountains, having some pain in a leg or something, or just being cold and tired and saying, I want to go home. <laughs> well, that's the funny part of it. Of course, this is a very serious business, but I think the picture also shows us how much value we put to one single human life, how much we are willing to invest and to organize to save one single human life. Nothing wrong with a helicopter. It can be used to fire hellfire rockets and kill Palestinian children. It can be used as an ambulance helicopter to save people. It's all about your basic attitude and your political ambitions. So when I'm on call, which I am a week at a time, I was on call two weeks ago, I should not only look out for some uh, pristine, beautiful snow flakes to ski myself, I should keep an eye on the less fortunate. Like the family in uh, Saitun who just lost their children and their home, and the boy who just lost all his uh, playmates in Saitun. That's part of my responsibility, that's part of my plight. So um, this gorgeous palace, this is my university hospital, always supplied with water, Power, electricity, drugs, supplies of all sorts, staff, salaries, safety, and freedom. And let's bear that in mind when we travel to Gaza. But all of, because all of these uh, preconditions for good health work are lacking in, uh, in Gaza, Gaza's hospital. So let's leave my paradise city and go to Gaza. And... Um, the first impression is what it is like when the Israeli war machine is bombing the incarcerated people of Gaza. 1.8 million people not allowed to escape even.
Haifa, 100,000 inhabitants. Gaza City, 600,000 inhabitants. Not allowed to escape, no shelters, no early warning systems, no civil defense, just a naked civilian population. And there has been four attacks on Gaza since 2006, not three, but four. 2006, 8, 9, 12, and 14. Everyone more and more brutal. The last one, by far the most brutal. We thought it couldn't get much worse than 2009. Last year was 500% worse. And I'll come back to the number 500%. So if you are eight years or elder, older in Gaza today, you have been through four Israeli military attacks and you have lived your life, your whole life in a besieged ghetto. And um, again, the average age in Gaza is between 17.7 and 18 years and 60% are less than 18 years. It's a child population. This boy, I met him in the emergency room in Shifa Hospital and you can read his eyes and you can read his expression. His family house has just been bombed. He's looking for his parents. We clean his wounds, we stitch him up and we have to send him out again because we don't have capacity to admit him. That's part of the brutal reality when you work with medical systems in disasters, you have to do a sorting, prioritizing, a triage. I have been working in Gaza through all these last four attacks. I was there in 2006, I was there in 2009, I was there working in Shifa in 2012, and I was there uh, last summer uh, in 2014. And every time I have been part of the Palestinian healthcare system, that's what I define as solidarity medicine. I report to the Minister of Health, whoever he is, and I say that I work under their leadership where they want me to work. We don't set up anything outside. This is part of the medical solidarity tradition in Norway. Now, I don't support Hamas, I don't support Fatah, I don't support Shihad, I don't support PA, I don't support any Palestinian fraction or political party. Along with the Norwegian Solidarity Movement, I support the Palestinian people and their right to resist occupation. And that is actually their legal right, according to international law. An occupied people has the right to fight the occupiers with the weapons that they see fit. I condemn any attack on civilian structures now, previous and coming, be it from the Palestinian side or from the Israeli side. The civilians should be protected and not attacked. And of course, this experience uh, from having worked in Gaza for 15 years and being part of the medical system for the last four attacks has left a deep impression on me. When I talk to you today, I try to control my voice. I've met some young Palestinians today and um, I am actually much more emotional about this than I can show because then I wouldn't be able to uh, fulfill my, my lecture, simply. I can't just stand here weeping, can I? But there is, a, there is an ocean of tears behind um, our faces, uh, all of us who have been working in Gaza. Two books, I Think Gaza, the last edition with a foreword by my good friend Noam Chomsky, and this is Night in Gaza which you can buy here today. And all the incomes, all my incomes, goes to the uh, Tromsø Foundation, which is a solidarity foundation where you can apply for scholarships. I don't earn anything, of course. So I dedicate this talk to the real heroes. I am not a hero. The real heroes are the people of Gaza and their medical staff. They are my f role models, my tutors, and my heroes. Dr. Suvis Gaik, the surgeon, the medical head of uh, Shifa Hospital, Dr. Aborish, my good friend, the surgical uh, chief doctor and the triage head, and all the young doctors, the medical students, the volunteers, the paramedics, they are the heroes. I dedicate it to the young fellows, the exhausted fellows, the nurses, the students, as I said, who work tirelessly, never giving up, never giving in, despite working hours of 24, 72, 80 hours continuous bombardment and themselves being double victims because they were on call and many of them had their family members and neighbors coming in as patients and some of them, God forbid, as dead victims of the bombing. They never gave up and look at their faces and I'm sure you remember it was a Ramadan so we had nothing to eat and nothing to drink from sunrise to sunset and it was pretty hard work. 
I dedicate it to all the support staff, like Shadi, my good friend, the janitor and cleaner who could clean the operating room in four minutes to make it ready for the next surgery. There are six operating rooms in Shifa. We had 15, 20 waiting to have life-saving damage control surgery, and he was as a, as a tornado when he was cleaning, and always with a joke, always with a smile. And I've listed here the deficiencies for all the medical uh, institutions, in particular the surgical units in Gaza's hospitals. Because of the siege, they lack everything. They lack the basic supplies. They lack maintenance. They lack upgrading of their medical equipment. Like the CT machine in Shifa Hospital was broken during the attacks. We had to take every head injured patient out in an ambulance, which is really a deadly mission because the Israelis are shooting at the ambulances to go to Mustache Fal Quds in order to have the CT scan and then go back to, to Shifa. So this has dire consequences for the operations. I have been accused of being a political doctor. And sometimes I'm introduced as a doctor and an activist. And I'm, I'm not really sure if that's a compliment or sort of a, uh, an insult. I am very proud to be an activist. I'm very proud to be a medical doctor. Because no doctor, no medical worker can be apolitical. Because medicine is all about distributional power and basic living conditions. Firkov, the famous German pathologist, said that politics is nothing else but medicine on a large scale. I totally subscribe to that, totally. And WHO has said that the conditions in which people live and work can create or destroy their health. Well, that's the fundamentals of, of public health, you know, preventive medicine. And nowhere else is that more graphically described than in Gaza. I took this picture in 2009. This is a typical habitat in Gaza. 75% of the 1.8 million Palestinians in Gaza are formerly refugees internal refugees, but they have been refugees since 48, or since 76, or 67, or since whatever war there has been. And this is how they are living. And the preconditions for life is hard, and the preconditions for health is even harder. Now, we think about health and health care, or, or public health, as depending on, you know, like ambulance helicopters and fancy machines and you know, open heart surgery and all that. That's not the basic foundation for public health. The basic foundation for public health are these seven points. It's safe water, it's food security, human security, sanitation, housing, work, education, and then healthcare. And in Gaza, all of these factors are lacking, and in particular, water, food, and security. 92% of the water in Gaza is undrinkable. There is no power. There is no gasoline. The uh, energy prices have soared 400% since Sisi and his, uh, and his dictators stopped all the tunnels in the southern parts of Gaza and the siege from Israel. There's almost no energy, no fuel, no diesel. Food security, 80%, 85% of the families are totally depending on external help to have food. Food security is different from food safety. Food security means that when you get up in the morning, you, you know what you and your family will, ha will have to eat for breakfast, lunch, and, and supper. Human security, that you don't get killed on your way to work, or in your home, or in school. Absolutely absent in Gaza, and the other factors also. The Lancet, my favorite medical scientific journal, I had a front page a few years ago, saying that health is the most important foreign policy issue of our time. I totally agree with that because health is such a political issue. On a global scale, on a regional scale, on an individual, individual scale like in occupied Palestine. And Richard Horton, uh, the uh, editor of, of Lancet, has taken consequences of this, and he has established the Lancet Palestine Health Alliance, which is actually a research consortium in a cooperation between Berset University in occupied Palestine West Bank and the Lancet. We have conferences every year, and I urge the young and whoever would be interested in, in uh, medical science to participate in the conventions, which are held uh, in the springtime every year. The next one is in March in Amman. And there, the result of this um, scientific uh, project, this uh, campaign to build science among Palestinian young doctors and researchers are presented. And this is the first printed edition of the Lancet series, Health in the Occupied Palestinian Territory. So let's have a look at the four major Israeli attacks on Gaza, the four Israeli attacks. Can I take off my jacket? Is that impolite? 
I, I have dressed up. I've made sure I'm looking proper. <laughs> so they can't, at least can't say that I'm uh, looking like a jerk. Um, four attacks. And let's just repeat what the Geneva Convention is saying about war and war crimes. You know, there are international regulations regulating how you should behave in a conflict, in a war situation. And they are pretty much adopted by the civilized world. It is prohibited to impose collective punishment, to organize indiscriminate attacks, and to use force in a disproportionate way. There are demands. Number one, the uh, fighting parties should always take precautions during attacks. They should protect civilians and maybe most importantly when it comes to Israel, the occupier is responsible to protect the civilian population in the occupied part uh, in, in, in the territory that they occupy. And of course they're not allowed to, to settle their own population like Israel is doing big time with the colonies and the occupiers on the West Bank. But bear in mind that these are well accepted rules of behavior in a conflict, in an armed conflict. In my opinion, Palestine, Gaza, West Bank, Diaspora, it's not a difficult conflict. It is a difficult occupation. And it is a difficult occupation that is illegal and that needs to be brought to an end. So it's not really a conflict between two equal parties in a way having a disagreement over some sort of land or something. This is an occupation and as such it is illegal. Norway was occupied by f uh, through five years by the German army from 40 to 45. I, don't make a, I do not make a comparison between the Nazi regime and, and, and the Zionist regime. But I do make a comparison between occupation and occupation. We fought the German forces with arms. Our pregnant women would carry weapons in their, in their strollers. Uh, our resistant fighters are our heroes today. We make statues and jubileums and we're you know, really saluting them as our heroes. They were called terrorists by the Germans. If anybody today would call those five years the Norwegian-German conflict, they would be beaten up. It was the German occupation of Norway, period. And we threw them out through a collective effort where the people stood strong and said, we do not accept occupation. Well, let's go back to these four last attacks. Uh, I will not go in detail on 2006 uh, because I don't have the time. Cast lead, let's start with that. 5,400 injured, 1,400 killed. And the proportion of killed Israelis to killed Palestinians was 1 to 100. 13 Israelis were killed, 10 of them soldiers, 5 of the 10 soldiers killed by friendly fire, their own soldiers killing themselves or killing the other soldiers. Three of the killed were civilians, none of them were children. Wounded Israelis to Palestinians, 1 to 10. This is Ahmed who was killed, I will come back to him. Among the wounded, a large number of children. 1,872 children wounded, 431 children killed. Operation Cast Lead. More than 2,300 children killed and injured. Now, I'm going to ask you a question again and again. It is, suppose that Palestinian fighters went into Israel through the tunnels and killed 431 Israeli children. What would the world have said? What would the White House have done? What would NATO have done? What would EU have done? Number one, they would call it by its right name, terror. And number two, they would impose at least sanctions, probably, as my friends in Gaza say, Dr. Matz, don't ask these stupid questions. You know what would happen. We would have been nuked. And this is the graphic, numeric illustration of apartheid. It is that the Palestinian lives, and in particular the lives of children, do not count as an Israeli life. And the foundation for that is, of course, apartheid. One of the many children's children that I participated in the treatment of in ICU. Very high standard, very good doctors, very good hospitals, but lacking everything. In 2009, so many meaningless losses, this young man. I've just amputated his right leg. Um, because it was almost all off. I had to take it completely off to stop the bleeding. He's waiting for the surgical uh, uh, operation to finish up the amputation. Uh, it's a lineup outside the operating room. We have stopped the bleeding. He's under control now, but of course he will 
be without a leg for the rest of his life. Done nothing wrong, nothing else but being Palestinian in Gaza. 2012, pillar of defense, 900 injured, more than 100 killed. Just two years after, three years after. Large numbers of wounded were taken to the hospitals. Again, this is from the emergency room, crowded emergency rooms, unsorted patients come in. You know, Gaza is so small, it's only four kilometers on the top and 12 km kilometers on the bottom. It's, it's, so, it's so narrow that actually from when we hear the bombing till we hear the ambulances come to Shifa, it's only minutes. It's, it's just load and go. It's no sort of airway control and neck, neck collars and scoop stretchers. It's just load and go and come into the hospital. So it's coming in in, in waves of blood, screams, death, and horrible injuries. The results, the consequences, is human suffering. This is Hanadi Abuzur. She was 10. She come from the Abuzur family in Saitun. Four o'clock in the morning, the Israeli drone comes, shoots a rocket on the rooftop, signaling that we will take down this house in four to five minutes. Get out. This is what the Israelis claim to be warning of the population. They barely get out of bed. It's a large family. And they are actually trapped in the building when it's bombed. Three of her uh, siblings were killed, five seriously wounded, among them her twin brother. Severe head injury, and as you can see, she is crying tears. This is no coincidence, this is a doctrine. It's called the Dachia Doctrine, and the Dachia Doctrine was developed in 2006 when the Israelis took on Lebanon, and they were going to eradicate the leadership of Hezbollah, as you know. They bombed Beirut, and Dachia means suburb, I believe, in Arabic. And Dachia is, was the suburb in Beirut where Hezbollah had its leadership. By the way, the same as the Israelis tried in 1982 when they were bombing and attacking Beirut to kill the leadership of the then militant resistance against the occupation, PLO, and Abu Amar, the chairman, Yasser Arafat. The Dachia doctrine is simple, and it's well documented. Here it's expressed by one of the commanders uh, on the second day of the attack in 2009, Kastled. He says the aim of the attack should be, quote, to send Gaza decades into the past. That's a nice way of saying bomb them back to the Stone Age. And um, in, in sort of imposing as much damage as possible, a maximum number of casualties, and keeping the IDF casualties at a minimum level. So the uh, Dachia doctrine is to destroy as much as possible of the infrastructure to make the rebuilding as difficult as possible, i.e. the siege and not allowing building material in, and to cause a maximum number of, of human casualties in order to deter the population from resisting the occupation. It's a way to try to, to break the backbone of the resistance. It's deliberate, it's planned, it's executed by the government of Israel, who, are, who is 100% responsible, and it has the full support of your government. That's why I travel so often to the U.S. to speak, because you are the game changers. It's only the people of the U.S. who can change this. You are so important, that's why I'm so happy to talk to you today. The results of the Dachia Doctrine, here I'm two days after the ceasefire in uh, 2012, traveling to Saitun to try to see the buildings and the neighborhoods from where, I, uh, received, from where we received patients and I participated in the treatment of these patients. And this was what I found uh, in the street where uh, Hanadi Abusur was living. She was sleeping in this building with her family when it was bombed by the Israeli army. This is how it looks when you see the Dachia doctrine in real life. Is this distinction? Is this proportionality? Is this precaution? Is this protection of civilians? Is this no collective punishment? No, it is all the above. These are all individual breaches of international law. And I again, I repeat, I condemn any Palestinian attack on any civilian target in Israel. But as I will show you in numbers, that is not the problem. The problem are the Israeli attacks. And then last year, July to August, Operation Protective Edge, more than 11,000 injured, 2,250 killed. The numbers keep rising. Here are the detailed numbers. And I, my, my source for this is the second Goldstone report that came out just recently, which is the uh, 
the uh, sum up from the commission that was established by the UN to investigate what happened during the last attack. It's very detailed, of course, totally dismissed by the Israeli government, but it is the most factual source we can use. You see the numbers? 551 Palestinian children killed in 51 days. Now, which other government, which other army would get away with killing 10 children a day for 51 days and nights without sanctions? If it had been IS, you know, we would have been, oh, oh, and rightly so. But when it is IS rail, it goes away without any sanctions. I asked my, my publisher if I could use IS rail throughout the book, and he said, no way, you cannot do that. <laughs> and I'm happy he advised me that. But I, I see the parallels. There is a striking parallel. And when you're standing in Gaza with a beheaded eight-year-old boy, I don't care if that head was blown off by a drone rocket or by a shrapnel from an Israeli tank shell or from the sword of a crazy IS person. The child is without a head and it's done on purpose by some power and they are responsible. And behind the numbers, there are faces, there are names, there are families, there are children. I think this is the most painful picture I took. It's a boy, it's in the emergency room it is the day when the Israelis bombed the Mustafa Mohammed al durra which is the pediatric hospital in northern Gaza. I went to see that hospital. It's described in the book. I thought he came from there, but he didn't. He came from another neighborhood, just being bombed. He was asking if we had seen his parents. No, we hadn't. He was holding on to himself. You can see he's meager because he's malnourished because of the siege. We clean his wounds. We stitch a few uh, deep cuts, and we send him out again. Three and a half thousand injured children, physically injured children, and more than 1.2 million youngsters and children, of course, being deeply affected. This is the report I just showed you. Get it uh, and read it because it is a very good source of uh, information. They say that summing up the Israeli army, called the Israeli Defense Forces, in Gaza only called IAF, the Israeli Attack Forces, they carried out more than 6,000 airstrikes through the 51 days and nights. 6,000 airstrikes. And it caused immense destruction. If you look at this uh, satellite map, you can see that all these yellow and red and uh, orange uh, squares are destroyed buildings. This is Gaza City in the northern part. Shifa is here, about here. This is the harbor where the four Shababs were killed. And you can see the density of bombardment. Three and a half thousand buildings destroyed only in Gaza City. And of course, these are civilian buildings. By and large, 98%. And in the buildings, there are people living. And when the Israelis are dropping leaflets or they're calling their mobiles or they're knocking on the roof with their drone rockets, telling them to leave, they say, where should we leave? It's actually safer to be in this house than to be in the streets running around. And if the Israeli army and the Israeli government wanted a fight man-to-man -man between the Israelis and the Palestinian fighters, why didn't they just open up the borders so the civilians could flee to Jordan or to Egypt? No, they don't. They keep it sieged, and they're bombing like in a cage. I cannot think of any more cowardish way of waging a warfare than to bomb 1.8 million people who are not allowed to escape and who are denied the right to have shelters. And if they are provided with shelters, the occupier will bomb the shelters as well, as we will see. Again from the report, while during cast lead, 3,000 high explosive artillery shells were fired. During the last attack, 19,000 artillery shells fired on Gaza. It's an increase of 522%, my friends. And we thought 2009 was bad. Last year was five times worse, and I can tell you it really was five times worse. The Palestinians shot 4,500 rockets and mortars. 90% of them were shot down by the uh, dome defense system developed by U.S. and Israel together. I'll come back to the, to the numbers of losses. And again, immense destruction. This is an, an apartment building. It looks like an earthquake. It's not an earthquake. It's the picture of the Israeli army in action, in action, deliberately targeting residential areas. 
Half of the killed were killed in families where three or more family members were killed. It seemed like the Israeli commanders were trying to eradicate the DNA of resistance. Never before have they executed so many families, total families, as during the last attack. And here are the numbers. Uh, these are the Palestinian fatalities. These are the Israeli fatalities. And again, it's from the reports, the sources given here. On the Israeli side, 71 killed, 66 were occupation soldiers, four were civilians, one was a, an Israeli child. That is one Israeli child too much. No Israeli children should get killed, of course. No Israeli civilians should get killed. They should live in peace and security, like my family in Norway. But history has taught us that an occupied people will, will resist and that an occupying power will not have peace until the occupation has ended. On the Palestinian side, 279 uh, fighters, soldiers. These two numbers were updated, uh, and I'll come back to that in a minute. 8% uh, casualties, or, or yeah, uh, fatalities on the Israeli side. At least 70% of the fatalities of the, on the Palestinian side were civilians. The end number, was 551 killed Palestinian children and 299 killed Palestinian women. I want you to know these numbers by heart because I hear too often people talking about this and they say, oh, about 350 or 410 or some random number of Palestinian children. Had they been Israeli, I can tell you, all the world would have known the exact number. So don't forget 551 and 552. 551 is the number of Palestinian children killed. 552 is the total number of children killed during the 51 days and nights. Now, if we do our math and we look at the ratio um, of injured and killed, and of course, behind the numbers, there is a massive amount of injured. This is a young taxi driver. He was shot in his cab right outside Shifa Hospital. We thought they were actually starting to bomb Shifa. I was in the OR, he came directly in. He needs three surgical teams. He needs a team for his complicated orthopedic injuries. He needs an ENT team because he has complicated fractures of the facial skeleton. And he needs a neurosurgical team because he has a shrapnel that has entered into his brain. He gets all the three teams. They manage to do this under very, very, very minimal uh, circumstances. So if we do the ratio, this is what comes out. For every Palestinian fighter that the Israeli army killed, they killed 5.3 civilians. For every Israeli soldier that the Palestinian killed, they killed 0.06 Israeli civilians. And now you can ask yourself who are protecting the civilians and who are attacking the civilians. These are the numbers. So the Israeli army killed five times more civilians than they killed their opponent, which is the armed forces of Palestine. Is this an attack or is this defense? Who is attacking? Who is defending? In my opinion, there is no doubt that Israel is attacking and the Palestinians are doing their best to defend their people. Distinction, proportionality, precaution, protection of civilians? No, it's a massive collective punishment. Does might means right? No, it doesn't. And the day that we accept that might means right, we are losing grip of international law. We are losing grip of justice. That means that if you have a drone and you have the rockets, you can do what you like. You can kill people at random, wherever you like. This is a very dangerous development. This is a US drone, very much used in Gaza. It's equipped with uh, four Hellfire rockets, by the way, produced uh, partially in Norway. Very embarrassing. Norway delivering out the peace prize, sort of and at the same time being one of the largest arms exporter per capita in the world. Double standards all the way. We're no, no better than you are. But we're not occupying. Well, in a little bit. A little bit in Libya and a little bit in Afghanistan. So these drones have no pilot. They have a very advanced optical system, can see everything on the ground, can be airborne for up to 72 hours, and they are directed from a control room where drone pilots are sitting and uh, the U.S. Air Force currently are training more drone pilots than jet fighter pilots, actually. 
They can steer, conduct the, the drone with a joystick. They have a little red button. They can fire the rockets. And on their screens, they see everything on the ground. This is called the fire and forget. Because you, have, you can forget about losing your own forces. And you know the politicians, one thing they hate is to have the soldiers coming home in body bags. That's always a political uh, sort of a, a pressure on their decisions. With the drones, you don't have to worry about losing your own soldiers. Fire and forget, it's called. We saw the results, 2009, 12, and 14. This Shabab, this boy, 14, came in after a drone attack in, uh, in Al Montar together with an, uh, an elderly guy and 24 years old. He survived. That was the man with the amputated leg. He had his right leg ripped off at the level of the hip, his left leg almost ripped off, and large concussion marks from a blast injury on the chest and the abdomen, causing massive internal bleedings. This is probably from a dime bomb, dense inert metal explosive. We try for some time, some minutes to save him, but he dies between our hands. We can do nothing. And we cannot take him to the OR because the chances for survival are too small to actually uh, justify the use of that table. And the drone pilots, they see everything on the ground. They can tell the difference between a man and a woman, a child and an adult, and everything is documented. Everything is video filmed. There is no such thing as collateral damage. It's only central damage. Another boy who came in, Ahmed, 12, both legs cut off like from a big sword, large burns from an extreme heat. This uh, dime weapons causes a ball of fire uh, and uh, extreme heat, uh, several thousand uh, centigrades. His groin was open, his buttocks were sliced off the pelvic. Uh, I said we could not do, do anything. Somebody told me in the air that it was the cousin of Dr. Abwashwa, my good friend, the surgeon, who was doing surgery in the next room. I said, let's start. I'm doing chest compressions here. And uh, somebody went across the hall to get Abwashwa. I've known him for 15 years. He's a very good general surgeon. He came, out, came into the room with his gloves on, his face mask. He looked over at the table, and he nodded, and he said, yeah, it's Ahmed. It's the son of my sister. He went over to Ahmed, stroke his forehead. We terminated the resuscitation. I went around the table, put my arms around Amo uh, Isam, and I cried. And I said, you know, the, the few words you can say, I, I'm so sorry. He lifted my chin, looked me straight in the eyes and said, uh, Mats, this is our life. We just have to carry on. Went back, completed the surgery, and we had coffee afterwards and talked about Ahmed and his, his love for soccer. A recent report from the last attack you can find this on the internet. It's the Defense for Children International doing a very extensive uh, investigation on uh, the Gaza's children. Here are some of their results. These are the number of kids killed throughout the last um, four attacks. Actually, they're adding two minor attacks. If we add up with the last numbers, it's 1,115 children killed by the Israeli forces since 2006. Again, ask yourself, which other governmental force would get away with killing more than 1,000 children in eight years without having sanctions on their head? You know, international sanctions, economical sanctions, trade sanctions, embargoes. Never Israel. Never. It, it was strange to be in Gaza last summer and see how EU, US, NATO were pulling out the sanction cards quickly, 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 not against Israel as they were bombing, but against Russia because of Ukraine. And I don't support what Russia did in Ukraine, but it showed so very clearly this double standard. There are international sanctions. They are being used. They are effective and mostly used in a very unjust way, actually, by the way, like with Iraq and, and Libya, but never against Israel, despite the killing of thousands of children. And if you break down the method of killing, 164 of these 535 that they studied from the last attack were killed by drone-fired missiles, like you have seen. 164 children, that is not by chance. That is not by chance. And Ahmed, well, he was killed. He was executed. His crime, being a Palestinian boy, born in Gaza. Nothing else. 
Shimon Peres said on the 17th of uh, on the 14th of January. That was just a few days before they withdrew from Gaza in 2009. This was 90% according to the plan. They killed more than 400 children. Subtract 90%, that's 40. And you have 360 children killed according to the plan. And who is held responsible for the killing of Ahmed and the other 428 children? Nobody, nobody, nobody. This is what uh, uh, Shimon Peres said, actually, uh, in a speech for IPAC, your dearly beloved IPAC, uh, in... Um, in uh, Jerusalem on the 14th of January 2009. And he said the aim was to deal, to provide a strong blow to the people of Gaza. What is that? Well, that is collective punishment. You're not allowed to deal a hard blow to a people. You are supposed to target the military forces and not the people. So this actually makes Shimon Peres a war criminal. Are they ever taken to the International Criminal Court? Never, ever. So I think that it's a core moral, political, and medical challenge to handle the Israeli impunity. So far, so far, my friends, one Israeli soldier has been convicted since 2006. One soldier, and he was convicted in 2012, following the cast led 2009. He killed two Palestinian women, a mother and, his, and her daughter, who was coming towards the soldier with a white flag, and he shot them both at point blank. For that crime, he got 45 days in prison. <coughs> so a Palestinian life is 22 and a half days in prison, if ever you get convicted. That's less what you get than what you get for drunk driving in Norway. Again, an apartheid number. Again, an apartheid number. Both the number of unconvicted and the number of days when you are really convicted. And as I said, nowhere is safe in Gaza. Last year, they were bombing massively UN shelters. The UN shelters mostly being UN schools, light blue painted in the UN colors. The coordinates given to the Israeli generals through the Geneva and through the mechanisms they have to, co uh, to communicate with the commanders, up to seven, eight, nine, ten times. The exact, let long, the GPS positions. It seems like they use the positions to target, the, uh, to target the, um, the shelters. This is Jabalia Elementary Girls School, A and B, after the attack on the 30th of July. Actually, these are the numbers. They attacked four UN shelters, killing 15, 21, and 11 civilians in the shelters and injuring more than 400, three, between three and 400. In UN shelters, officially established, given the coordinates, absolutely no excuse and absolutely no consequences for the Israeli army and for the Israeli government. And the key sponsor of what I would call this state terrorism is actually your government. That's why you are the game changer. This is a postcard I got during one of my speaking tours. I think it's a very nice campaign. Yes, we can. And the flip side says, uh, I urge you to hold Israel accountable. So, my dear friends, you are really the most important people in the world when it comes to the occupation of Palestine. It's you who can influence. It's you who can be active. It's you who can mobilize more people. On the foundation of basic justice, you don't have to be very political. It's just simple decency in this world. So ending the systematic impunity for past crimes would serve as a deterrent against a repetition and, as, and is a true critical component to ensure the protection of civilians. This is uh, from uh, a Bet Salim report. This is one of the brilliant Israeli non-governmental humanitarian organizations saying that to end the impunity is vital in order to have this not be repeated. I see you watch the watch, no problems. I will skip the, uh, as usual, I have too much to say. Okay. I always have too much to say. I'm just gonna uh, say two words about the siege. I was contracted by UNRWA last summer. Uh, uh, I was in Gaza three weeks before the attack, and I made a report, which you can find on the internet, which says, um, which is actually describing the conditions in the public sector in Gaza prior prior to the attack. I went home to be on call, then the bombing started, and I just I have, hadn't even unpacked, so I just put some clean underwear and went back to Gaza, and that's when uh, the attack was all. Uh, in full action. So what I found was insufficient capacity of the healthcare system, insufficient supplies, 
largely insufficient preventive medicine for the non-communicable non diseases and the pregnancies, of course, chronic disorders, no reconstruction of the human habitat from the three previous attacks, insufficient evacuation of people needing medical aid outside Gaza, insufficient education, postgraduate in, uh, education, because people are not allowed to travel, and no freedom. That was my sum up, and in particular, in the field of water, food, and uh, solid waste and uh, wastewater uh, cleaning, the situation was disastrous. Affecting the foundation for public health for 1.8 million people. All man-made, all deliberately made since 2007 because of the siege. So I summed up that the Israeli siege causes widespread negative effects on public health, the health sector and the civilian structures before the last attack. Now, I said the demography, uh, these are the last numbers. 43% are less than 15, 64% are less than 24, mean age 18 years, among the 1.8 million incarcerated people. This is a ghetto, this is a modern ghetto, and this is a ghetto where people fight to survive. What did the Jews do in the Warsaw ghetto? They were digging tunnels. What did they take? The heroes of the Warsaw ghetto. They took weapons and food through the tunnels. No siege, no tunnels, no occupation, no rockets. It's simple as that. End the occupation, end the siege, and there will be a solution. What is the consequence of the siege for the children? Well, a number of uh, very important studies. This one showing that three-fourths of the children below two years are anemic as a result of the siege. And every third child in Gaza is either wasted, stunted, or underweight. Stunted meaning that you're two standard deviations shorter than you should have been. It's a very sensitive indicator of protein balance and protein nutrition. So this is again the sharp end of the man-made malnutrition in Gaza. <laughs> A wounded Palestinian child in Gaza, likely a little boy. He is likely to have anemia, negative protein balance, prior to the injury. He's already in a very bad position to handle an injury. He will lose more blood. He will need protein to rebuild from his scars. He will probably have septicemia. And of course, he has already a massive traumatic experience. This is prior to the last attack. And the pregnant women, the same. There are at any given time 41,000 pregnant women in Gaza. There are 170 delivery per day and about 30 cesarean sections. Many of them not possible to perform during the bombing because it's too dangerous to move. And for the first time, we have seen for the first time in 50 years that the infant mortality has increased in Gaza. Gaza and Palestine used to be the most educated place in the Arab world. The healthcare, extremely good. Mortality rates going down, down, down. This is a study that was published in August, and you can see that the neonatal mortality is going up, and the infant mortality is going up. This is only until 2011. And I think that if you add the attack in 12 and 14, we will see a further rise in infant mortality, a man-made increase in infant mortality. So the key factors for Palestinian children's ill health is the occupation, it's the siege, and it's the impunity. And the West and the powers, EU, NATO, US, allowing this apartheid system to continue as we are speaking. So to end, the pre-attack situation in Gaza was already extreme, as I've shown you. And then came the attack. Starting on July the 8th. And here you can see the bombarding of Beit Lahia. In one hour, in one hour, they completely destroyed a whole neighborhood with, its, with the Israeli bombing. You can see how immensely powerful it is. And we had the patients coming in to ship out. In particular, the children, the young ones, those who were looking for their parents, having to take care of their small siblings, those who were being scared in whatever shelter they might find, and all the injury. And to end with, I still have seven minutes, right? Because we started seven over. It's okay. Do you allow me to go on for some few more? Can we make a vote if we are? No, I'm very democratic. It's yes, okay. 
okay, Shifa Hospital, let's go to Shifa Hospital. Uh, my, my brother, my good friend Max Blumenthal, has called Shifa uh, the home uh, of the brave, and I, I absolutely subscribe to that. By the way, my book, my last book, has the introduction by a Jew, Max Blumenthal, and the postscript by a Palestinian, Mohammed Umar, and then there is a Norwegian cluttering between the two. So it <laughs> opens with a Jewish voice, it ends with a Palestinian voice, both of them against occupation, both of them saying, we will have victory. Shifa Hospital, surgical block, main entrance here, most filmed emergency entrance in the world. If we go on the inside, there's just been a bombing, and it looks like this. <laughs> this is Dr. Aburish doing the sorting. To the right, the dying, the dead, the walking, talking. The lucky one. To the left. To the right, walking, talking, and dying and dead. To the left, those with injuries that we think that we can pay. The operating rooms, totally crammed. Here we are just finishing another traumatic amputation. Uh, Bare-feeted surgeons because we didn't have more greens. Um, and as I said, the hospitals were lacking everything. And even worse, when the bombing starts, the electricity is cut by the Israeli occupation forces. They're bombing the one single power plant. We, we, we are without electricity 18 to 20 hours per 24 hours. There are two generators for the hospital lacking spare parts. So the, the light goes out three, four, five times an hour. Then the operation room lamps are sort of blacking out. And we're using the mobile phone screens to see where is the spleen and where is the Where's the liver? Because the Palestinians are not allowed to have torches, of course, because you can use it in the tunnels. So I'm the only one with a headlight. So I have to run from room to room with my headlight to light up. Well, it's, it's almost unimaginable that they can do such fantastic surgery as they do. And this is how it looks after bombardment. This is uh, northern parts. This was a hospital. This is al Wafa Rehabilitation Hospital. One of the 17 hospitals more or less damaged by the Israeli bombing. Not only did the Israeli attack cause a massive influx of patients, but it also took down the capacity of the medical system. So there was a systematic attack, not only on the population, but also on the medical system. Normally, you know, like here in Washington today, we have a balance between medical resources and medical needs. Probably we have an overbalance of resources. Since Netanyahu is in town, I guess there are multiple surgical teams waiting to handle the situation. Gaza, total unbalance. Increasing medical needs, decreasing medical resources. Why? Well, because of the bombing, we have 12,000 casualties. Of course, all the dying and dead also coming to the hospitals. Increased needs for the chronic diseases, for the pregnant women, and of course, for people with mental health problems. Resources diminished by the siege, by the lack of equipment, drugs, supplies, by ambulance being bombed, staff being killed, and hospitals being attacked. You don't believe it before you see it. So injuries increasing vastly, hospitals being destroyed vastly. 100% man-made disaster. The morning of the Sashaya massacre, the 20th of July, we had 400 patients coming to Shifa that night. My friends, surgeon, resident, and boss of surgery, would your hospital handle 400 patients in a night without water, electricity, and supplies? The Palestinians do. We were hearing cries from the emergency. We ran down, and it was our friend and their colleague, Fouad Jaber, 27 years old, married with a daughter of four, and Khaled Hamad, a brave Palestinian journalist, both totally marked in international marks with red crescent symbols on the ambulance and on their uniforms, both killed when the Israeli tank shot a rocket at their ambulance, killed all on board. They came in and we were absolutely devastated. The Israeli army killed 21 medical staff, injured 83 and destroyed 47 ambulances during the attack last summer. In 2009, they killed 16 medical staff, injured 38 and destroyed 15 ambulances. How can you get away with that? How can I get away with that without a single sanction on you? It is unbelievable. It is unbelievable. They destroyed 17 hospitals, more or less. That's 53% of the hospitals. 60% of the primary health care clinics, 58, were targeted, destroyed, or damaged with broken glass, falling down ceilings, you know, all sorts of uh, damage. This is Al-Wafa Hospital. 
one hospitals and seven clinics had to be completely closed in a situation with a, with a massive increase in the medical needs. Why is this silenced and goes unsanctioned? This is a map that the UN provided showing exact position of every destroyed and bombed hospital and clinic the world knew all the time. And then comes the bombing of the uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Border Hospital in Afghanistan. And rightly so, there is an uproar and your general commander, the president, and everybody are apologizing for the U.S. forces having bombed the hospital. should never happen. But when Israel is bombing 17, nobody says a word. So, to end, a few glimpses from Shifa, home of the brave. The surgeons working tirelessly to try to save those who are needing. Uh, this is from the operating room, 4 o'clock in the morning. One of my good friends, neurosurgeon, we're doing um, shrapnel uh, surgery to remove shrapnel for someone we think can survive. We published two papers, Dr. Subis Geik and myself, on the patient flow. You can read them in The Lancet. I will not go into detail, only show you. <laughs> So in 51 days, 8,500 people came to this one hospital. 1,800 were admitted. Half of them needed immediate surgery. I will not have time to go through the surgeries, but this is a massive load, and few other places in the world would the staff be able to handle this if it hadn't been for the Palestinian staff. Uh, the uh, division, the sorting was simple. The lucky, the walking, talking with open airways and enough blood pressure to perfuse the brain. Look over them, uh, ABC principles, uh, standard triage, stitching, cleaning, sending out. The second category, the needing, those who could be saved with uh, a limited amount of damage control surgery, like this man I talked about. And then the hopeless, those who, despite our resuscitative efforts, the first minutes would die or would not be um, having a return of spontaneous circulation. So we had to terminate like this gentleman who died in the emergency room. The killed, 2,200. This was a family of four. They came in on the morning of the Seshaya massacre. First came the two siblings, eight and 10, lying on the same stretcher. Um, please do not film the pictures, thank you. Um, the boy without a head, her sis his sister, half the head blown away. Dad and mother came a few minutes after. They're all in each each one in each uh, body bag. In my emergency room, we have cotton body bags. No, not body bags, but uh, linens on the stretchers, you know, white crisp sheets. In Gaza, the sheets are plastic. And when you look closer, there is a zipper along three of the edges of the plastic sheet, and you can open it and make it into a body bag. You saw that 490 were dying or dead when they came. It was so frequent that we had to terminate the efforts in the emergency room and just had to roll them into the body bag like this family of four. I will save you the pictures because they are too gruesome. And he, we didn't have more body bags, so he was just uh, tugged into a sheet and taken around the corner down to the uh, morgue, which was always filled up outside hundreds of bereaved relatives and family members in despair and grief and screaming agony like we would have been. The children, Three and a half thousand wounded. He had a partial amputation of the third uh, toe on the right foot. Um, uh, yeah, no, on the left foot, I'm sorry. We didn't have enough local anesthetics, so the anesthesia is three strong men holding him as the orthopedic surgeon is cutting off the remaining bone parts of his toe. Very painful. Not, not because of lack of empathy, but because of lack of resources. In Norway, he would have been taken to the operating room, had full anesthesia, patients, uh, family present, everything. This is Gaza 2014. Two boys, two brothers come in. Uh, it's the morning hours, five, six, five, shortly before six o'clock in the morning on the Seshaya night massacre. We don't know where their parents are. He has severe burns in the face. His hair is totally charcoal. It falls off when I touch this. He's starting wheezing because his airways are getting uh, swollen. It's, it's a very dangerous uh, condition. He has inhaled the fumes. He has fragment wounds, probably penetrating. I take him in my arms. My uh, colleague, the Palestinian doctor, takes his brother. We run around to the back side of the surgical block where the burn unit is, put him on the bed. I get ready to intubate him. Put the camera down. I don't notice that I have pushed the video button. 
I come home to Norway after the mission. I look through my material to start writing the book, and I find this video that I will show you. I could not remember his screams. And that tells you a lot about how concentrated we are and how much we have to sort of filter out in order to be operative. But when I came home and I saw this video, it opened up to my ocean of cares, and I cried for a day. And I realized <coughs> how much pain I had contained, and I could only imagine how much pain my colleagues, my brothers and sisters, have contained, the parents, the siblings. This is what, this is what you will not see on the picture. This is what it was sounding like in the burn unit when I was going to put him asleep. I'm standing in this part of the picture in my greens. This is me. It's good. I give him some ketamine iron. This is good. This is good. Habibi, Habibi, Habibi. And the ketamine works, the anesthesia works, he falls asleep, I can put down the tube and he has some few hours of rest and peace and sleep in his hard life. Both uh, siblings, both boys survived, they are still in Gaza, still incarcerated, still under siege, waiting for the next attack. And it will happen if we don't stop it. Ten years old, shrapnel to the neck, same facial burn, charcoal hair. I've just intubated him, in addition to that very dangerous shrapnel to the, to the neck affecting the main artery to the brain. He has an open fracture uh, with uh, threatened artery and uh, nerves, so he has an orthopedic team here, a neurosurgical team here, and later um, a plastic surgical team. They provide all of it. There are 500, 220, 220 surgeons in Shifa, extremely clever people to, to work under such uh, circumstances. Again, a silent picture. But what do the children hear? What do they have in their memory when they come in? What did they experience on the way to the hospital? It is like this. This is sound sampled from this really war machine symphony outside Shifa. I put it together with some pictures of children that I met and participated in. The treatment of first two siblings, lucky ones, walking, talking, wounded. To the right, this is the sound of their childhood in Gaza 2014. These are the rockets from the F-16 for the Apache. These are the drones. One, two, often three or four drones ahead of us. Then we get the shrapnel injuries, much more shrapnel injuries this time than uh, 2012 and 2009. Lots and lots of shrapnel injuries because they were having their artillery, so many artillery shells fired at the de densely populated areas. Here we're doing a top to toe, another injury coming in, extremely uh, damaged and uh, very challenging. Uh, we examine him. Uh, here are some of the shra shrapnels that we collected from the Israeli artillery shells, extremely sharp, like razors on the edges. And this is what it looks, multiple inlets. We took him to the OR because we thought we could save him. Every one of these wounds represent an inlet of a metal fragment, and you have to explore every single inlet to see if it has damaged vessels, organs like liver, the liver, the kidneys here, the lungs here, 
may be the bones, the femoral bone or the pelvic bone here. He has bleeding from both uh, chest cavities. He's in life danger. His life is endangered, and we have to quickly find out where the bleeding is and try trying to save her. She came in with a small wound in the left shoulder. I put her to sleep. She was a very darling girl. This is again uh, the from Seshaia, a horrible night when we had 400. But these shrapnels are extremely uh, dangerous. And when you look on the exit side, it's a large wound and her uh, axillary artery and her axillary um, nerve, uh, nerve um, center is uh, affected. And every, every one of the shrapnels have to be removed if the patient is to survive at least the bigger ones. And it's a tedious work, very time consuming and very difficult. You have to be concentrated all the time. Lots of amputations, man-made. This boy came in, both legs uh, torn off at the level of the knees. We're stabilizing him. I give him ketamine, take him to the operating room. He is surviving, but of course, after survival, he will have a long ICU uh, course because of septicemia and infections and malnutrition. And these patients are really demanding in the ICU field. We had almost a doubled mortality in ICU compared to 2008. 12. So, to conclude, this really impunity. I mentioned for you that it's for forbidden with collective punishment, with indiscriminate attacks, with dispropor disproportionate use of force. You should take precautions and save the population. You should protect the civilians. All of these obligations are being broken and violated by successive Israeli governments. They also violate the Declaration of Human Rights, of children's rights, of women's rights. And thanks to the support from successive US governments, they can go on and go on and go on without being stopped or without being taken to ICC. The Palestinian people are extremely resilient. Every time I come back from Gaza, I feel like a richer human being. I learn, I deepen my respect for the Palestinians. And to me, Gaza is first and foremost resilience, survival, dignity, and resistance. And during my last stay, everybody, from doctors to nurses, from paramedics to parents, from old to, to do young, to, from men to women, from fighter to civilians, they said, it's not Hamas, it's not Fatah, it's not Ramallah or Gaza. It's us, the Palestinian people. We are all part of the resistance now and we will not surrender. We will not surrender. We will never give up our resistance. We will continue until we have a free Palestine. And with those words, I think I thank you for the attention and I am um, happy to take uh, questions from you. Thank you very much. Dr. Gilbert, I'm Mike Springman, author of Visas for Al-Qaeda, CIA Handouts That Rock the World. Would you comment on the idea opposed by the Israelis that America and Israel are working together to drive Arabs and Muslims out of the Middle East into Europe to generate mutual distrust and hatred? It, it sounds like you have the answer yourself. <laughs> so I'll leave the answer to you. Thank you. Um, thank you for being here today, and thank you for uh, <laughs> sharing your story with us. Um, I'm wondering if you could touch on something that you didn't talk about, and that is what I'm assuming is an extreme mental health crisis of the present and the future in, in Gaza. Yeah, thank you for the question. It's, it's, often, it's often post. And, um, you know, I mean, you don't have to be a psychiatrist to understand what kind of mental uh, uh, stress it is to live and to have these repetitious attacks. I am very careful to pathologize the Palestinian people, the families, the children, and to impose that they are all sort of drifting around in some sort of uh, collective PTSD. They are not. They are managing, they are standing tall, and they are indeed really... Uh, I think an example that uh, you can uh, survive the most heinous situations in life as long as you have your main factors for resilience present. And that is family support, 
it is the support from your social network, and it is a return to normality as quickly as possible. That given, studies from the Gaza Municipality Mental Health Program, very good scientific studies done together with Finnish mental health researchers, shows that one of 10 children will have persistent signs of chronic stress, nine of 10 will be fine. But that, that is under the precondition that normality is returning, that schools are opening, that dad and mom can go to work, that your home is rebuilt, that water is coming back, that you have food on the table. Then children have a phenomenous capacity, elasticity, resilience, to actually absorb these kind of trauma, even losses. But the, the, the mean and the really, what should I say, the, the gruesome, aspect of these repetitious attacks is that every time the children and the families have come to some sort of peace, could I say, peace in mind, you know, there hasn't been bombing for one and a half years, we have got some bricks, we have put together some, you know, we're not longer in the tent, we're in some building, then it's repeated. And this repetitious traumatization, we don't know what effects it has on a long-term scale. But I think we have to balance between not pathologizing and at the same time respecting that there is a need for psychiatric treatment among that part of the population who is vulnerable who, and who have sustained symptoms of depression, psychosis and other kinds of um, disease, mental disease. But not 15 jumbo jets with American and Norwegian and European psychologists and psychiatrists sent down can heal the wounds of the occupation. That is only healed by ending the occupation. Was that an answer? Yes. Um, where is the, okay, one over here. Uh, Dr. Gilbert, yep. uh, hi. Um, My senior as surgical a, colleague. Sir, as a, as, a, as a trauma surgeon who's worked at some of the busiest centers in this country and have been distressed at the social ills that led to that. I can only tell you that, uh, first a comment, I'm, I'm overwhelmed with, with admiration. I, I can't express uh, one, the degree of, of, of uh, just overwhelming, uh, complete, both from a humanist and medical standpoint, sense of challenge that you bring humanism to, so I, I have just uh, extreme admiration for what you do, number one. Number two, the, the <laughs> I suspect you could spend another lecture with what I'm about to ask you, which is the sequela of those patients that did survive. I mean, by the time you get to resources such as blood and blood products, antibiotics, nutritional support, those that do survive, particularly the children, the amputations and rehabilitation, I was about to ask about Shifa, but you showed how many, you know, even there's a sense of danger even in that area. Mm -hmm. So what about those unmet needs from a rehab standpoint? Uh, are there just amputees who never get prosthesis, never learn to walk, no wheelchairs, no anything? Could you comment on that? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, my dear colleague. I pass that uh, compliment on to my colleagues in Gaza, of course. I will tell them what you have said. It means a lot to them. I have to tell you that our colleagues in Gaza, they don't give up. They are organizing medical conventions. After 2009, they had a big medical convention on surgery, uh, surgical treatment of trauma. Last year, they had one after the attack. Of course, the Israelis are not allowing any of the foreign scholars into lecture. So we have to do it by Skype. I mean, we are breaking the siege, but we have to do it. I did it from, from Trumse. So it means a world to them to know that there are people on the other side of the wall that follow them, that support them, that respect them. So if you can in any way communicate with Dr. Sobi Skype, he would, uh, he would be extremely honored to do that. Number two, the amputees. Yes, there is a very good prosthesis workshop in Gaza. It's called the Artificial Limb and Polio Center, ALPC, it's run by Palestinians. It provides high quality, modern prosthesis, top of the line. The problem is of course to get the, the parts from Switzerland into Gaza through the siege, number one, and number two, the funding. 
Gaza is in a, in a complete economical disaster. They cannot fund fuel for the ambulances, let alone wages for the salaries for the staff in the ALPC and in the hospitals. When the attack started last July, the staff in all the governmental hospitals in Gaza had not been paid their salaries for half a year. Still, they went to work. But it's a very good point with the amputees. We're now doing a study following up a thousand amputees from 2006 until now. We have published already the first abstract. We can show that they do quite well, provided two things, that they get back to some sort of normality and that they can have an income. Those who have an income and get back to some sort of normality, they show significantly less depression, phantom pain and sleep disturbances. Uh, so, uh, if you want to support any sort of good goals in Gaza, you could support the ALPC. That's incredibly important because it is getting the, the Palestinians back on their feet with their own resources. They are extremely proud and that they can have made in Palestine processes instead of some imported NGO post processes by itself is part of the resistance. Thank you so much for your comments. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Asma. I'm from Gaza. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum um, uh, It's uh, just a comment. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for uh, showing um, what you've experienced in 2014. I've been there during all these, um, uh, what happened in 2008, and I lost uh, my cousin uh, in 2012 and 2014 as well. Um, so thank you very much for doing that. And I just want to say something about the trauma uh, and the children. Um, uh, like also um, uh, a marginalized area that uh, does is not being paid attention to is young people who also suffer from trauma. Like I have been here in DC for two months and whenever I hear uh, a helicopter, I really go under my bed because I think that it's gonna bomb me. So this thing that it takes us years actually and uh, and I think even after 50 years will not recover from this. Uh, and I think I just want to say that the only thing we want to do is or we want to have is that not to stay stuck in Gaza and to live and wait for when and uh, keep wondering when is the next uh, bombing is going to happen or when we will be killed the next moment. So thank you for um, uh, showing this. Thank you, Sister Aish. I think we should give her an applause because she is among the really brave ones, really. And, um, uh, and thank you for, for giving that important remark on the, on the youth because, as I've told you, the majority of the inhabitants are young people. Then they have, they have exactly the same dreams as an American youth, as a Norwegian youth. They want to go skateboard, they want to go uh, uh, rap. They have the best rap group in Palestine, DAM. They are, uh, they do these, you know, the, the street ballets. They're phenomenally active and creative and, and under siege. And I think that what you say about the traumatization, I'm not at all trying to diminish the consequences, but I don't want to paint the picture of only a suffering population because that is not a true picture. Don't you agree? Yeah. It is also a resilient population. And, um, you gave me now the um, association to say what I wanted to say in the beginning, that I am not the one who should have been standing here. It should have been Dr. Sobiskaik or Dr. Aburish. should not be a Norwegian spoiled, affluent brat from Norway. It should be one of the Palestinian medical leaders, of course. Why is he not here? Why is she not here? Because they're not let out. They're not allowed to travel. They don't have freedom. And for the Palestinian, the quote, no freedom without justice, is a fundamental thesis those days. Thank you. Okay? Yes, on your side. Thank you. Um, I bet you're very much a hero among the Palestinian people, especially in Gaza. And I bet you there's a lot of little babies, Palestinian babies named Mads. They're not made by me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a follow-up with this Vietnamese woman. Um, mm. You know she's gotten plastic surgery mm. in the past couple of months. You know about that. Unfortunately, there's no one picture from Palestine that has made such an important impact. Um, you, you ask many times why. I'm sorry. I can't answer that question. I'm sorry. 
But I want to ask you about where are the international medical associations, the AMA? Oh, can I, can I answer that in a, with a quick, you, you, it's as if we had appointed this. This is an editorial from The Lancet written by Richard Horton, and we're writing January 2009, okay? By the end of Operation Castlet, he has just published a paper by Eric Foss and myself named Inside Al Shifa Hospital, getting massive attacks from the Zionists for having published it. You can read it online. He writes an editorial saying, we are disappointed by the silence of national medical associations and professional bodies worldwide. In response to this destruction and dislocation of health services, their leaders, through their inaction, are complicit in a preventable tragedy that may have long-lasting public health consequences, not only for Gaza, but also for the entire region. You're totally right, madam. This is a huge crime of silence mm. from the American Medical Association. And I can show you because I've done a study. I've, I did a search in JAMA, in uh, New England, in British Medical Journal, and in The Lancet, with keywords Gaza, Palestine, terrorism, Israel, and uh, occupation. And in JAMA and in New England, there were one and zero references on Gaza and Palestine. In Lancet, it was 450. In BMJ, it was 360 uh, from the top of my head. So actually, there is a systematic silencing of the facts on the ground, even in the medical community, even speaking in the scientific language, they are simply obliterating. They are simply trying to wipe out, turning their back to the medical realities in Gaza and in the West Bank and in the diaspora, in Jordan, in Lebanon, in Egypt, in Syria, like Yarmouk. Now, when was the last time that the world turned their back to people being extinct? That was in 1936, 37, 38. And we, we promised ourselves it was, should never happen again. We stand strong with the Jewish people in condemning Holocaust. Of course we do. But what were the root causes of Holocaust? It was racism and it was, com it was silence and complicity from the leaders in Europe. And that, I think, is why... Zionism has such a strong grip on us. I am by no means an anti-Semite. Of course not. I'm a strong anti-racist. And as I said, the brave Jewish author Max Blumenthal has written the introduction to my book. But I'm an anti-Zionist because I am against apartheid and racism. And that's an important difference. So I think that this is precisely what you're pointing to. Silence is being complicit. What did Desmond Tutu say? You know, the brave bishop from South Africa, he says, if you remain neutral in a situation of injustice and oppression, you end on the side of the oppressor. There is no neutrality. Thank you. Okay. Then I would like to take this last, to, to take back the Palestinian voice and let that end. This is Rita Gyakman, the brilliant female professor of public health at Birsait University. This is the conclusion in her uh, beautiful paper in The Lancet called Health as Human Security. It's from the first issue of The Lancet, Health in the Occupied Palestinian Territory. And she says, hope for improving health and quality of life of Palestinians will exist only once people recognize that the structural and political conditions that they endure in the occupied Palestinian territory are the key determinants of population health. It's the occupation, stupid, you know? <laughs> It's not, it's not the conflict. It's not the complicated thing, you know, uh, back and forth. It's an unjust occupation that has lasted for close to 70 years. It has to end. So as a doctor, I have a prescription. It's coming here. You know, I was taught by our previous prime minister, Miss Gruhalen Brundtland, who taught me public health. She said, never, ever forget about society as a precondition for health. I could not go back to Gaza again and again, wipe up the blood, stand with my friends and brothers and sisters in the healthcare, stitch up the wounds, adjust the ventilators, put in the cannulas, without asking myself, how can we prevent this? How can this be stopped? I would be a betrayer if I did not ask that question. 
So here is the prescription from Dr. Gilbert. Lift the siege immediately, stop the bombing of Gaza immediately, end the occupation, and end Israeli apartheid. That's the doctor's prescription. Inshallah, we will see it one day. Thank you so much. Dr. Gilbert, thank you so much for this very enlightening presentation. It was very disturbing, but I think we all need to know. Thank you for sharing the experiences and the voices of those we can't hear here in Washington. Thanks for your passion, for your forthrightness, um, and for your caring. And thank you for having me, and I think you spent a better day here than listening to Netanyahu, don't you think? <laughs> and now I'll go sign the books. <laughs> <laughs>